Before I hand over to our speakers, uh, we are Scotland's International Development Alliance. I'm Laura and the Effectiveness and Learning Advisor. We'd encourage you to introduce yourselves via the chat box. Um, our organisation is a network body. We have over 200 members, both organisational members and also individual members. Uh, everything from universities, consultancies, micro NGOs and fantastic international NGOs too. Um, we have a range of services uh, from capacity development, policy networking, and we do a number of things like webinars, training, working groups. And so I'm going to hand over to our fab speakers today, Nairas and the Cloudburst group. So Rebecca, over to you. Great. Thanks, Laura and the Scottish International Development Alliance and all of you joining us on this webinar. So I'm Rebecca Adler. I head the MEL team at Nairas LTS and joined by colleagues from NIRS LTS and, clouds from cloud, and colleagues from Cloudburst, all of who will introduce themselves later. Um, we're really excited to, sorry, I'm just trying to get my, obviously that, there to go, work, perfect. Really excited to talk to you guys all about this. And we really want to highlight this webinar is, an, is you know, a participati participatory opportunity to really draw on our collective experience about how we can improve practices for how we've been doing MEL during the pandemic. As we presenting, won't have all the answers. And so we really see this as an opportunity to capture the collective learning from the community about what we've been doing and how we can think about that for us going forward. So to get us thinking, we'll be providing a really quick overview. Our colleagues presenting will present four case studies from their own experiences, their challenges, their opportunities, some of the things that they've experienced and then we'll move to breakout rooms to discuss and capture more lesson learning from everyone's experience and then close out with some summary materials. And we'll be sharing the slides and there'll be additional information hopefully emerging from today's discussion. So who would have thought <laughs> a year ago we would still be sat here in our little online boxes alone the same way from the pandemic starting a year ago? I know I wouldn't have thought about it. At the outset, I think many of us had to switch instantly plans that we had had for the upcoming year. So projects had to fo pivot focus to deal with emerging requirements. So what they were doing in terms of COVID and the pandemic. And we as MEL professionals had to adapt activities and plans to deal with the new restrictions, how we collect data on new risks, on the current risks, on the things that were happening and the projects were focused on doing, and also new data points. I know from my own experience, even if the projects I worked on weren't being shifted to focus to deal with COVID, I was still getting asked like, okay, so how have they adjusted? How have they adapted? Can there still be progress made on these activities and kind of on these impacts, even if the country context has changed and people are focusing on COVID? I know from my own experience, I really focus first on how can you collect data if you can't travel or meet in person. But as I've throughout the year, as I've reflected on it, I've thought actually it has to be wider than that. You know, how are we really um, able to think about this new way of working and really think about, you know, what can we scope and frame and do in this way of working? And what does this mean for going forward to kind of improve our practices because there are so many benefits to this remote working and what can we do that doesn't just focus on oh the pandemic has created so many challenges but what can we learn about how we can improve malpractices going forward so just quickly on that um i'd be really useful to hear about everyone and see see the poll results from everyone um i think the poll is getting shared Yes, perfect. So really useful to see that um, our first question on the poll was basically how has it impacted and it's unsurprising that it hasn't impacted that there's been no impact to anyone's work and that it's been largely focused on the activities, but not the scope and then some on the scope and the activity. So it'll be really useful to hear from everyone's experience about exactly how it has changed their experience. So now um, I just wanted to present this little diagram about what I think really just sets the scene of how we can consider and adapt practices throughout the MEL cycle. As, as this whole year has made me think, okay, there's more that we can do beyond just data collection. And I think we have to think holistically of the whole MEL cycle. 
So I know I really, in the start, like didn't think enough about this design and concept phase, which I think is really important. Um, and really thinking about how can we actually do Mel work in this new world? So can I really answer the same amount of questions? Do, are the same questions really still relevant? You know, what do we need to think about that um, from, from kind of what, what are the questions actually gonna be used for? What's really practical? You know, what are the timeframes? What additional data do I need if I can't go and see something in person? What types of methods can I use? And even really practical things like what are the timeframes and kind of the focus? What, what are the stakeholders who I need to speak about, speak with? What are they balancing? Do they have childcare concerns? Are they homeschooling? So really thinking that through and all of, you know, what does that mean for the timeframes of the activities that I can do? The next phase is kind of data collection. And I think that's where there's been a lot of focus and there's been some really exciting new ways of collecting data through remote interviews, online tools and surveys. And my colleagues will talk through some of their examples of how they've done it. I think one thing that I know I'm not as good at is really thinking about the analysis stage. You know, what can we do? There's, there's really new interesting digital tools that we can actually use to help us improve our practices to think about analysis. Um, and then finally, there's the dissemination of results. So, you know, if you're not in person, if you're not sharing learning in person and through workshops, you know, how can how can I get my messages to the stakeholders that really need it? So is that the type of outputs? Do I need to have a one on one discussion with key stakeholders? You know, how do you how do you influence people? How do you make the results that you're presenting the most accessible? Is it about data visualization? You know, people are already balancing lots of information during the pandemic. How do you make that the most accessible? And I think the final thing, which I think actually I would really love for us to hear talk about, and I think often gets undervalued, is this aspect of management and governance. So there's so many ways management and governance get influenced by the remote working. You have teams that are working across countries, across time zones, dealing with scheduling issues. You have people, stakeholders who aren't, you know, you're not in person, you're not in someone's office. How do you get them to meet? You have your client interactions. How do you have a participatory process that supports learning if you're not able to involve people? And then there's the stuff that, you know, is never really fun, but is really important. So how do you manage a lot of ML work collects really sensitive data? How do you protect that data sensitively? How do you make sure you're reaching the most vulnerable people and collecting data from the most vulnerable people, you know, and you're not including everyone. So I think it's really important that we think about all of these things and we consider how they impact all of the work. And I think there's some really positive opportunities from how what we can take going forward. So I will hand over to my colleague, Matthew, who will be giving us the findings from the second poll. Thanks, thanks, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so I'm an evaluation consultant at NIRAS LTS. Um, and just looking at the, the poll results, um, so the question was if you adapted your male activities and whether you were happy with the solutions. Um, and so 20% of you said yes, um, it had no impact on the quality of the male activities. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, and then the majority of you, 75% said it, it partly, and, um, and then a very few of you obviously said it, it had no impact. Um, yes, thanks. So we'll, I think we'll just move on to the, the next slide. Um, and I guess, so just, this is just the last slide we have before we get into our case studies. But I think like something what we were wanting out of the session is to, is to kind of reflect on not just like how we, dealing with the, um, you know, the COVID situation, but also like what, what we can learn from the COVID situation and to make, to make MEL stronger and to make it more impactful in terms of, you know, having a contribution towards societal resilience. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of almost like an experiment to see, well, if we do these, these things slightly differently, um, you know, how does it work? And, and what what do we what did we dislike about what we were doing before um, the COVID situation? So I've just I mean I think we'll we'll discuss this through the case studies and through our, gr our group um, breakout sessions. But just I mean just some of the potential things we, that, that 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 might get covered are about you know how the extent to which um, you know locally based evaluators are used and and their role and their importance and the, the sort of ethics around that um, in terms of like 
parachuting in international development consultants just to do short assignments. And um, so, th you know, th that's something that we've, we've reflected on. And, and obviously, there's a lot, lot being said about like digital tools and technology and how we use that better. Um, there's, also, there's also thinking about the extent to which we, we make use of secondary data sources and, and findings from past evaluations. Um, so we don't reinvent the wheel, we can kind of apply those to new contexts instead of just collecting data for the sake of it. Um, and then just the, the fourth sort of thing was about real time learning, like developing systems that could help, you know, the, the, the implementers, the people who are doing the projects to, to kind of collect their own data and create their own systems for learning um, so that they may be less dependent on, on evaluators. Um, yeah, so this is some of the broad, some of the sort of potential topics we could cover. Um, and then, yeah, so then just for the poll findings, we asked you um, if you've adapted your mole activities and would you like to keep them? Um, so, the, you're, you, you know, you answered that partly. So hopefully we can un unpack that and find, you know, what are the specific things you'd like to keep and what are the things you would like to, to drop and you never want to go back to again. Um, yeah, thanks. So just the next, just briefly, just to introduce you to the case studies. Um, so we've got four really interesting case study examples of, of evaluators who've, who've um, been working on different projects and different geographies, different sized evaluations. Um, and I, I'll ask each case study um, presented to introduce themselves. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let them do that. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll spend about seven minutes on each on each one, and then we'll have time for questions and answers um, afterwards. But please, you know, add add questions in the chat box. Um, yeah, thanks. So I, I'll just hand over then to to Vicky, um, who's going to be talking about um, her work on the Darwin Initiative. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Um, and welcome everybody. It's um, great to have so many people here today. Let me just get my notes up. So yeah, so my name is Victoria Pinion. Um, I'm a senior consultant at Miras LTS International and I'm project manager for three grant funds. So the Darwin Initiative, Darwin Plus and the Illegal Wildlife Trade Challenge Fund. So the funds are competitive grant schemes um, that work on biodiversity conservation and environment and they're funded by the UK government, specifically um, DEFRA. So there are three different funds and each have some slight differences, but we do manage them in a similar way. So Darwin Plus focuses on the UK overseas territories, and whereas Darwin Initiative and the IWT Challenge Fund and work in developing countries worldwide. And in addition to focusing on biodiversity, they also have a strong um, focus on poverty alleviation. So the funds, um, since the funds have started, they've supported over a thousand projects in over 150 countries. And at the moment, there's more than 180 active projects. And our role is um, to provide overall fund administration. So that includes everything from kind of managing the application cycles to managing and supporting projects once they're up and running. But obviously, I'm here today um, to talk about the MEL element of that. So we, we also run the project-based m &E for projects. So um, there's one specific element of our m &E which I'll focus on, and that is um, what we call our midterm reviews. So more MTRs. So each year, um, as well as doing sort of desk-based reviews of project reporting, we select a small sample of projects for a field visit, and that's led by an independent reviewer. And we typically cluster those geographically um, into two clusters and carry out reviews on four projects in total. And the purpose of the MTRs is not only to confirm how the project is progressing and kind of independently review that, but also to support the project with any issues they might have, um, draw out lessons um, for the wider community, and perhaps also inform the structure of the overall program. So this year, um, because of COVID, all the MTRs were carried out remotely. Um, and there were a few opportunities this afforded us. Um, so positively, it allowed us some more flexibility than we would normally have. So I mentioned earlier that we we tend to cluster the projects geographically, but obviously without the requirement for international travel, and we were no longer bound to that. Um, so that meant we could choose locations, which for example, there was only one active project. So obviously because the funds are worldwide, often there's not a cluster of projects working at any one time. Um, 
so yeah, we could choose a country where there's only one project working. Um, and it also meant that we could select projects which might have been inaccessible um, simply because of travel costs are too high or because of remoteness. So one of the MTRs we did this year was focused on a South Atlantic UK overseas territory um, in South Georgia and the Falkland Islands, which just in terms of um, space on ships <laughs> alone makes travel there quite tricky and expensive. Um, and also places we might not prioritise for visits because of potential security risks um, wouldn't normally be chosen. But this year, given that wasn't less, was less of a problem, meant we were able to choose a project working on illegal cheetah trade and working in Yemen, Ethiopia and Somaliland. So that was the first kind of key, key benefit really, that greater flexibility. But we also found it allowed us to kind of focus our activities a bit more effectively. So a normal MTR is based on a kind of full week in country um, and sort of dawn till dusk <laughs> and beyond type time. Um, so by having this kind of remote um, remote MTR, we were allowed to kind of keep things a bit more focused and a bit more efficient. So obviously we're aware people can't sit on meetings for full days. So we were really bound to keep things much more efficient and focused into discrete interviews or focus group sessions. But by being remote, we also noticed that we were able to kind of more sort of, as things were happening, we were able to sort of fact check or triangulate information we were finding um, from interviews or also to identify gaps. Um, so we found that was quite helpful. And also, I mean, in terms of our normal field work, we're often bound by big and by the end of the week, quite dirty <laughs> notebooks and struggling to find notes we might have made um, kind of three days ago. Um, but by being on our computers all the time, it was really nice to be able to take notes and um, to search and find things quite easily without seeming quite rude. Um, I think in, in focus groups, we're always mindful to be present and by not having to travel, we were actually able to have an additional person attend the interviews and take notes as well so we could be more present. Um, so lots of benefits there. And I think just in terms of getting clear information out of people without seeming distracted. Um, so on to the next slide, please. Um, of, of course, lots of challenges. Um, so I'd say, all, despite our best intentions of, of focusing activities, we did notice slippage um, with setting up interviews or with just being able to kind of pin people down um, within a focused period of time. Um, often, similarly with other work, there's a chance of getting distracted. You know, you're not in a week focused on a specific thing. You are perhaps getting pulled in other directions. Um, and I think that just comes from the nature of the work and there's an understood flexibility of remote work. People know you're at your desk and they can change the timing of a phone call if needed because you're not traveling there especially. Um, equally though, we were mindful of online meeting fatigue and working antisocial hours. Um, so as an after dinner meeting, for example, when we're all in the field together might be acceptable, um, but not really obviously in current working conditions. Um, we found that there are fewer opportunities for informal conversations and I think past experience has shown that, that they can be quite helpful. Um, so either in the car between field sites or over dinner, they can really help us draw out things from project teams that they might not otherwise feel comfortable talking about in the more formal sort of interview setting. Um, and also we were, we were, we felt we were more reliant on the project, sort of the team, um, in country or the project team um, to identify people for us to speak to and um, because we're not there ourselves we're not able to identify people um, independently and I, there, there could be a risk there there are ways of managing it and I think I'd be interested to hear from others um, who've had experience of this and how they might have might have overcome any potential bias of not being there yourselves and of course, and I'm sure this isn't a surprise to anybody, the lack of our ability to see project activities in person, we were reliant on projects sharing information with us, which can of course be down a specific lens and, and maybe quite selective. Um, but finally, just some final reflections. I think we went into it quite positively um, and looked to embrace the opportunity to try something different. And as you I maybe haven't spoken about directly, but linked with the polls earlier, we, we didn't really change the scope of what the MTRs were doing through this. We really just changed our methods of collecting data. Um, so I think we, we like the chance to select projects we might not have done under normal circumstances and 
in the past, I mentioned we've managed three funds. In, in no given year have we managed to um, carry out MTRs on projects from all funds in one year. And this was the first time we've been able to do that, um, so, which was fantastic. We, we wanted to use as much as possible to, to carry out the MTRs as we have done in the past. And for that reason, we found a locally based expert to do the Kenya review. But with shifts to travel restrictions, again, that's being carried out remotely, but from within country. Um, but I think we were very mindful that if we were to do any um, field work um, during this time, that we'd need to account for um, much more stringent health and safety. So although there's obviously there's great opportunities to use um, in-country personnel, there's also risks. The, the official, the official um, in-country guidelines might not be as stringent as UK guidelines and we were wanting to ensure that we were following best practice as much as possible. So I think as a, ensuring you're going into it with the right um, safeguards in place is, is really important, regardless of what the rules might actually be in the country you're working in. Um, and yeah, finally, I think something that Rebecca mentioned as well, having a, an awareness from the offset about how lockdown rules will be affecting people um, is, is really important. And obviously, not just our teams and the project teams, but people in country. Um, there are a few cases where people weren't where we expected them to be, <laughs> which sounds a little strange, but we understood people to be based in a certain place and it turns out they weren't. Um, and that's obviously because the pandemic has changed people's circumstances everywhere. So I think being open about that can be really helpful from the offset. Um, and I think that was it for me. So what I'm gonna do is pass over to my colleague, Becky, to talk about some of her experiences. Over to you, Becky. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Um, hi, everyone. It's lovely to be with you today. Um, my name is Rebecca Murray. I work in the MEL team um, in near SLTS and lead a range of different projects, most of which are focused on kind of research for development impact um, initiatives. And so I'm going to talk to you today about the evaluation we did last year. It was kind of more or less within the um, within the sort of January to December period last year, which was an evaluation of phase three of the ESRC and FCDO funded joint fund for poverty alleviation research program, um, which essentially um, funded a range of different social science projects um, across the global south that was a very broad geographical focus and beyond the kind of social science focus the theme was very broad as well um, and so uh, with with development impact in mind essentially and so our job was to assess the value of the investment by looking at the impact of the projects individually and then think about how that comes together as part of a program to create positive benefits in low and middle income countries um, there were three evaluation questions, um, each with a slightly different flavour. So the first one was uh, largely kind of focused on the academic output of the programme, given the nature of the nature of the beast, really. Um, the second one uh, was about uptake. So all of this research is produced, like who's actually doing anything with it, who's interested in it. And then and then the third one is around what changed on the back of that uptake. Um, so yeah, we had developed a method that tried to respond to all of those evaluation questions. Rebecca, can you switch slides? Um, so our original plan, as I said, it was largely to fall within the calendar year, um, but we wrote the proposal in kind of December before any of this <laughs> ridiculousness was known. Uh, so yeah, the original plan, did not anticipate the chaos that was to come. Um, the planned method was going to be an online survey covering all principal investigators and all co-eyes across the North and the South involved in the programme. Um, we were going to do about 60 um, remote interviews spanning uh, 16 odd projects. Um, we had a sample frame developed for that. And then we were going to do three country visits and look at a kind of cluster of projects as part of those visits. And, you know, we'd, we'd set it up this way because um, we wanted to make sure that 
we've got a strong kind of southern voice coming through um, and gender was also of particular interest so we had a big focus on inclusion um, and these visits were to be undertaken by a largely UK based um, team and then we also had built in um, partly because it's a particular specialism of one of the team members um, something called online moderated qualitative discussions um, which I'll talk to a little bit more um, in detail later because it was something that we majored more on in the end. Next slide, there we go. So in the new world, um, obviously everything had changed. So um, based on discussions with the client, um, we decided, well, I mean, it's hard to remember now, in the early days we were sort of assuming that we might be able to do field work later in the year um, but we weren't quite sure so we sort of kept our options open for a while but it sort of became <laughs> clearer over time that travel and in-person meetings were just going to be impossible um, we also assumed that it would be more difficult to engage with the people that we wanted to speak to because of caring responsibilities because you know they might be ill or, you know all of the things that were going on um, so we switched our approach um, to be more pragmatic, essentially. Um, so instead of trying to sample projects to get a complete take, we um, just tried to do it in a more bottom up way. So we did the catch all survey and then we asked researchers to opt in via that survey. And then we kind of snowball contacts for that particular project on the basis of that initial yes. Um, we were conscious that there was an inherent risk of bias in doing this, um, but given that it was all one big moving feast at the time, we felt that this was kind of the most effective and ethical way to, to sort of keep moving. Um, we tried to be as flexible as we could in terms of offering various forms of engagement, um, you know, being available, you know, whenever if someone was willing to speak to us we tried to be available in whatever form that was uh, required um, and then we also um, through discussions with the client discovered that there was quite a lot more that we could do around kind of data-driven quantitative analysis um, so in particular because obviously you had this um, you know pot of money that we had set aside for our in-country work um, and so in deciding what to spend that on, we decided to do more data driven stuff. So we worked with a company called Digital Science um, to do some very technical analysis around um, uh, sort of yeah, citations, authorship, um, using that secondary data source. And then we also did some text mining work across the joint fund documentation, looking at gender in particular. Um, this wasn't something that the client had sort of built into the terms of reference but the more we talked to them the more it was clear there was actually a bit of a gap and it was something that they were interested in next slide um, so there's a number of reflections i guess that jump out to me with a tiny bit of hindsight um, the first one is what i was just saying really so um, the 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 pandemic pushed us to focus more on the data science side which was ultimately quite positive. Um, it's not something we'd have suggested because the client weren't asking for it through the terms of reference, um, but actually it was a real gap for them that FCDO in particular were really happy that we were able to fill. Um, the online qualitative moderated discussion um, worked very well. It was, um, my colleague had done quite a lot of it in a UK context, but had never really trialed it um, for an international development project so it was a bit of a, a bit of a suck it and see exercise it was one that differed, uh, FCDO were particularly interested in um, so we we just kind of trialed it but it actually worked really well it's um, it's a we set it up you can set it up in various different ways we set it up as a three day you hire a platform and then you sort of set a you know a time frame so we set it up as a three day discussion and you invite people and then they can basically drop in and out at a time to suit them um, 
to contribute to a discussion. You can also cut it various ways. So we set it up so that everyone could see what everyone else was saying, but you can pull people into kind of sub question discussions. Um, so it seemed to us to be a really nice way of being able to create a sort of focus group vibe in a way that it can bring people across different time zones and geographies together in a way that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Um, because of the kind of technical setup, um, you know, bandwidth isn't really a problem. So it kind of promotes digital inclusion, I guess, from that perspective. Um, and we, um, yeah, our participants had the option to remain anonymous if they wanted to, but they didn't. Um, and they got into some really rich discussion that was really useful when we came to do the analysis. Um, yeah, so uh, the lack of field work, I guess, I mean, we we got by and we, we, we think we got to a good place, but you do lose something through a lack of field work that I think, you know, with reflection, we decided, uh, you know, if we if we were doing something like that again, we would want to use local consultants um, because you just don't get to speak to that wider network of people in country and do some of that triangulation um, that you're otherwise able to. So, so that was one of the take homes for me. And then the last point is really just around the sort of looking forward bit. So um, FCDO were really clear with us actually that you know, a lot of this learning around the online moderated qual, um, you know, this is their direction of travel anyway. Um, they don't want to see so many UK based um, consultants heading off on planes and screwing up the environment in the process uh, moving forward. And so a lot of what we were forced to do by the pandemic for the joint fund, I think, works in a broader sense moving forward. That um, was it for me on that project. And I will hand you over to my colleague, Clarissa. Great. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am also, I'm Clarissa. I'm also a consultant at LTS NERAS. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about my experience with the Columbia Bilateral Program Evaluation. Uh, and that's funded through the UK Prosperity Fund, which is a big cross-governmental fund um, that funds uh, about 24 programs globally, uh, one of them being the Columbia program, which was focused on economic rehabilitation in post-conflict and conflict regions in Columbia. Um, so this had a focus on three different sectors, which is what we, we called these strands uh, for, during the evaluation. Uh, so it focused on agriculture, infrastructure projects in Colombia, as, as well as institutional strengthening uh, and anti-corruption interventions. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is very similar to the kind of the approach of the two other case studies. Uh, so what Becky and, and Vicky spoke about. Um, but what I'd like to highlight here, I guess, is that uh, the Columbia program evaluation, rather than reducing the scope during the, the pandemic, uh, the client actually asked us to to be more detailed and more in depth. And what that meant for us was basically combining five different reports into one and using different annexes to target different audiences. So uh, the main body of the report was for the client and you know sometimes the, the annexes were specifically targeted for the uh, program uh, implementers. And so it was a lot of moving parts and and it wasn't obviously as as everyone else kind of uh, voiced you know it was is about kind of restructuring the scope during the pandemic to, to think okay how do we cover all our grounds um without compromising kind of the evaluation and what it what it might mean and what it what you know learning um tool it could be used so uh yeah overall um we we had the we conducted sorry 65 or more than 65 interviews via uh, different comms platforms um and we also had a national lead in colombia who is based in bogota who was leading more shorter focused mobile phone interviews um with the people who are living in more remote rural communities um and we also contacted different organizations who might be uh 
closely working with, with the target groups um, because it was obviously harder to reach uh, the people in those communities without being in country. Um, we were also able to do uh, a lot of focus group discussions. We limited it to, to no more than four people with a facilitator and we found that worked really well. Um, and we were lucky in a sense where I was actually in Colombia when everything started to shut down and, and we managed to do a, a long uh, week theory of change workshop and really understand the activities of the program um, before we got started. Uh, now, obviously, you know, when we left, we told everyone we'd be back in a month um, and pandemic wouldn't wouldn't be too, too long. Um, and, you know, we could we had this whole plan to come back uh, about two or three times. Um, but obviously that didn't happen and a year later we haven't <laughs> even come back to the office. Um, so the main, the big thing here actually I think was that we needed to, the team needed to meet more. So we are based in four different countries. Um, so I was, I'm here in Canada, the team leader was based in Mexico, we had people in Colombia and the UK. Um, and as, as Vicky mentioned, it was really nice when you're in country, it's nice to have these dinner informal chats to debrief after a long day of data collection. Um, and especially because the team leader's job was to synthesize these five massive reports together that um, each individual team member would lead on um, and making that kind of coherent and making sure we all came to a common understanding of our findings. Um, so these bi-weekly evaluation team catch-ups were really really important for us to kind of triangulate the findings um, and piece together what, what what we are hearing from different stakeholders from different sectors and different levels of governance uh, yeah you can go to the next slide Rebecca thanks <laughs> Um, so without going into too much detail on each point I think the take-home message for us was that we really uh, and maybe it was a good thing because we, we probably realized we weren't as organized before, but the pandemic really forced us to, to get so organized to the point where, um, you know, every meeting had a very clear agenda. We, we had given the participants homework to do and we said, okay, um, you know, you're, you're going to have five minutes to talk about your view from your sector, your project. Um, and we wanted to, to do that because, you know, I find that when, when you're in a workshop with different people, the participation might not be as high when you're um, you know, not, not in the same room as everyone. Um, and, uh, and then what also I think is really good to highlight is that we actually integrated the COVID-19 response from the team into the evaluation um, and, and kind of use that as a way of capturing how the team adapted um, in, in various settings, uh, did the context of the program change? Was it still relevant? Um, each intervention, you know, did, did, did COVID-19 change the priorities of the country even? And a lot of those questions, a lot of the answers to those was, was yes. Um, and uh, yeah, you can move to the next slide. Just leave it there. So uh, as, as everyone else already mentioned, the challenge was not being in, in country, obviously, to get a better sense and of the, the understand, better sense of the context um, and understanding of, of the wider program and, and who's involved and the decision makers. And, and uh, it's, it's quite a complex program that we dealt with. So um, really being able to hear from different, different stakeholders was really, really important. Um, I will also say that a lot of the stakeholders were very focused on COVID-19 response. So obviously, uh, local governments, and national governments were, you know, they didn't have very much time to, to, to discuss uh, the prosperity fund with us because they obviously had their own kind of emergency response um, to, to go through. Um, Quick thing for next time, I think we didn't realize how much time it would take us to get organized. And I think we, we should have accounted for that um, prior to, to getting started and, and rejigging the whole evaluation to, to meet kind of pandemic protocols. Um, and also the evaluation timing, um, it, because of the pandemic, the Columbia evaluation was delayed six months and that, 
because of that change, we, we weren't able to time it right so that the evaluation could feed into what was what they did every year, which was an annual review. Um, so we had to kind of put together our findings and then meet with the program team and, and discuss quickly without having our whole evaluation report ready and having preliminary findings workshops and, and whatnot. So um, the timing of the evaluation, obviously, if you can control it, it, it would be good to, to kind of make sure that it's, it stays relevant in while, while you're doing it rem remotely and it doesn't just become an extra chore for, for someone. Um, so yeah, so that's all for me and I will pass on the next case study to, to uh, Alita from Cloudburst. Thanks, Clarissa. So I'm Alita Starasta. I lead the Global Development Division of the Cloudburst Group. So Cloudburst is an impact-driven, women-owned small business, and we focus on empowering communities to build social, economic, and environmental resilience. Uh, so our company is headquartered in Washington, D.C., but I'm based in Lusaka, Zambia, and I've been out here since 2012. So I've been working remotely way before it was cool. So if you want to go to my next slide. So Cloudburst's portfolio includes a number of impact and performance evaluations around the globe. So when the pandemic began, we had to immediately pivot our entire approach. So since last March, we've conducted or we're wrapping up eight performance evaluations, three assessments, and four large end surveys across Asia, Africa, LAC, and Eastern Europe. And it's mostly for USAID and MCC. So for this presentation, I'm looking more of a meta lessons learned um, across all of this work versus a specific look into one project. So to be success successful, each of our evaluations required a creative reimagining of our data sources, our data collection tools, and our research design to make sure that we were collecting high quality representative data in a way that was both timely and cost effective. What I'm hoping to do today is look at what strategies have been most effective across our portfolio uh, with a particular emphasis on mobile phone survey mix, since that seemed to be of major interest to LTF. The next slide. Oh, nope, back up. I'm one slide back. Sorry. Okay, so this slide <laughs> shows some of the alternatives to in person surveying that we've employed like across this portfolio. Uh, the first one is these online quantitative surveys. So, when our sample population has had the, the literacy and the connectivity to participate in an online survey, these have been really great options for collecting rich data sets. Uh, providing monetary incentives for completion had a big impact on increasing the response rates in Cambodia and Ukraine, as well as in Nigeria. Uh, and we've also coupled online surveys with phone surveys in cases like Nigeria, where 90% of our sample was comfortable with an online survey, but there were some people on the edges that needed a different method. So quant surveys online worked far better in context than I would have expected they would have, you know, two years ago. Uh, the second one, focus group discussions and care eyes done over the internet. I think all the presenters have spoken to the different challenges and advantages of these groups, and we've had very similar experiences. I will say that building strong in-country teams have worked critical for us for doing good key informant interviews and focus groups instead of relying on an international consultant over Zoom. So whether these were in person or in Zoom, we put project money into coaching and capacity building groups for our, our in-country staff. Uh, and we think that's paid huge dividends and we're gonna plan on continuing that in the future. The hardest population for us to reach during COVID has been households in poor rural areas. And I'm really looking forward to a breakout group to see if anyone has figured out how to do this. Um, we have done in-person data collection since COVID has started in Malawi, and we're really hoping to do the same in Zambia and in Burkina Faso with appropriate COVID-19 precautions. I, I have found that donor policies are a much greater constraint on a, what is actually possible to do in country than the actual context in the ground, particularly in Africa, a little bit in Asia, Eastern Europe seems to be about the same, but Africa, I've just seen huge discrepancies on what's actually happening and feasible in country versus what more conservative donor policies are saying. 
Um, then the last data source that we've been really incorporating more is administrative data and data that's produced by other implementing partners. We had great success in an evaluation in Nigeria that we substituted, instead of a household survey, we coupled public opinion survey data that had been collected by another USAID implementing partner, and then coupled that with our own online survey with an expert group. Uh, and that eliminated the need of trying to do a household survey while still getting those perspectives. Um, and then finally, we've conducted some research on mobile phones, which I will talk about now on this slide. So, I have seen a lot of appetite from our clients to replace large end household surveys with phone surveys. I'm really curious to see if that's the same with the European donor pool. Um, I've also found that implementing phone surveys successfully is far more complicated than just dialing up baseline phone numbers. Uh, we've got, there's three primary options when you're looking at a mobile phone survey. There's uh, computer assisted telephone interviewing, which is an enumerator calls you and does a survey with you over the phone. There's also interactive voice response or IVR, uh, and a respondent will answer automated questions. And then there's SMS surveys that can be automated or manual. So for different projects, Cloudburst has explored all three methods. We have always chose the Kati methods. We just think that the higher response rate and greater confidence in our data quality outweighs the additional cost every time. So when we had chosen to pursue a phone survey, the first challenge is the sampling frame. Like we have to get the phone numbers. Um, there's a few different ways to, everything is on this slide. I have like three slides in this deck. <laughs> so, um, let's see. So yeah, the, the way that Clubbers tends to do it is this household collected sampling frame where we're either working with existing phone numbers that we have or doing some other way to get phone numbers for specific people that we want to sample. Um, we have explored random digital, random digit dialing and there's also an option where you can get a verified list of numbers from a mobile network operator or MNN sampling. It has not been a good fit for us. We just don't think it's worth the trade-off in the extended time and the lack of control over your sample. But World Bank has done this pretty well. IPA and JPAL studies have done it. It's just never been a good fit for us. Um, so in our best case scenario where we have some baseline data or midline data to work with with phone numbers, there's still a lot of work that has to go into getting the sampling frame. So for example, we have a survey in Zambia where uh, we have baseline and midline data and we have, that was collected in person. We have phone numbers from those years, but only 41% of the sample has the same phone number in both years. And it's collected just a year apart. Uh, we have a whole nother 38% of this sample with no phone number at all. And I think that's pretty representative to how much mobile technology is, has really penetrated some of these rural areas, like in Africa particularly. Uh, those numbers for our study in Burkina Faso are even lower. Um, so even in that situation where we have some existing phone numbers, we need to use other strategies to collect the rest of them. We've explored sending, working with implementing partners to collect phone numbers, um, which has worked for treatment areas. It's a lot harder in control areas. And we have also, we're piloting an approach where we send in a much smaller team or individuals into communities who are from those communities or nearby to send them out to tell people about our survey, collect their information and try and tell them like this survey is happening which has the added bonus of increasing our response rates later on. Okay. Uh, once we've decided how we're gonna get our sample, the next major challenge with phone surveys is adapting the research design. I loved the points that we made earlier about how the research questions we could ask pre-pandemic are just different than what we can ask now. I think that's especially critical for phone surveys. Um, when you change your data collection tool like this, you need to make, think really carefully about what you can answer. The survey instruments don't sound the same over the phone than they do in person. You have to make it simpler because you don't have that opportunity to build rapport. Enumerators can't look at faces to see if people are really understanding what's going on. So everything has to be really straightforward. Sensitive questions with a live enumerator are going to be much more unreliable to get answers to. 
Um, so those may not be the best kind of questions or research questions to ask with this method. There's also the survey length. The best phone survey that I've done was 10 minutes. Uh, you can go up to 20 with a CAPI survey. More than that, you're really just going to start getting garbage data and you're better off really working with your client to identify what is the one most important thing you want to learn and do it well instead of trying to answer like there are five things that worked before COVID that just are not going to adapt to this method. Let's see. Then there's also a cost, like there's time and there's money involved in doing this redesign. And I think if you have a client who's thinking about making that switch over from in-person data collection to remote, making sure that they understand the cost implications, not just of taking, you're not sending camps to the field anymore, so it should be cheaper, uh, but there's a lot of redesign costs and those have to get factored in. The third challenge, I'm still on this slide, Rebecca. <laughs> the third challenge here is talking about your, what an acceptable response rate is. In the best case, a response rate on mobile phone surveying is much lower than it's gonna be in person. Like a good response rate for us is 60%. I have seen 85%. I had one survey with a very specific set of circumstances where it, we started in person, then we went to 10 minute long surveys every two weeks with respondents over six months, which is a very unique set of circumstances, we hit 90% response rate there and I've never come close on anything else. So being realistic about what your sample, your response rate is going to be and then thinking about how that impacts your power, particularly for an impact evaluation. Uh, like in Mozambique, we realized that that response rate would cut our power too much to make doing a round of online worth the money. So we put in a stop work instead. We're just gonna wait that one out because we couldn't make the response rate fit what we were trying to learn. In other cases, we've just been able to draw a bigger sample and get the power we need through with, uh, with a lower response rate. And there's strategies for increasing response rate. The ones that we've used the most is incentive payments. And then if you can make some contact before the survey starts with SMS or a phone call or even better, the in-person visit, that's really helped increase our response rate. So my final note of caution on mobile phone surveying is that any sample that you get, it's just not going to be representative. Mobile phone surveying over-represents populations that are urban, male, young, and educated. And depending on the goals of the research, sometimes we decide to move ahead no, knowing this limitation. But cloud-based work often centers around vulnerable groups. And we most of the time decide that the limitations of mobile phone serving for representativeness is not worth the best fit. So, next slide. This is my last slide, I promise. I see you watching the clock. <laughs> As we've discussed, so. There's a lot of factors that we think about when we're trying to choose a data collection strategy. We're often choosing a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B to make a unique approach for each one of these, like over a dozen remote assessments and evaluations we've conducted this year. The major things we think about are the COVID-19 situation in the country, the appropriateness of different mobile or internet technologies, particularly when thinking about representativeness. My biggest fear as we move past COVID is that people are going to really like the ease, the lack of travel, and the ability to do things without going in country and try and do remote in places where you're missing the voices of a really important population. So I think really processing what you're trading off when you're choosing a technology that works in this context, but it's like who's not in the room is something to really think about, especially as we move ahead and think about what do we continue and what do we stop. Um, other things to think about, it's always the budget and the timeline. Remote surveying costs money too, even if you're not traveling. Um, and then how the methodology impacts the quality and the representativeness of our data. So I hope this was helpful and I look forward to people's questions. So back to you, Laura. Great, it's actually me, poor Alita. I was desperately, sorry, trying, to, tr desperately trying to move your slides forward <laughs> without it being <laughs> ready. <three> so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks everyone and thanks to all of our speakers um, for all of their really useful, um, really interesting to hear everyone's experiences and how it has adapted it. Everyone have, has adapted their work and kind of the challenges and opportunities. It's, it's really interesting to hear. We have time for a few questions that have come in through the group. And so one, I think um, Victoria and Clarissa both commented on focus group discussions. And there was a question about you know, without observations are a really key part of focus group discussions. And how have you in your work been able to capture those kind of observations, if you have been or kind of alternative um, solutions for focus group discussions? I'll perhaps let Clarissa talk more. So we, we were quite fortunate again with our project selection and um, this time around there was less of a need to do kind of community level focus groups. A lot of our um, project stakeholders were relatively high level um, kind of government stakeholders or project or members of the project team themselves. And I think we were able to get quite honest kind of um, sort of things at the interviews with them. Um, but we didn't really struggle with engagement that way. So perhaps Clarissa can comment more from her, her experience. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And yeah, I think similarly to Victoria, um, we obviously could only conduct focus group discussions to people with internet um, and uh, proper bandwidth. So um, what we did was that, and we thought this worked really well for people who could participate in focus group discussions. Um, again, we limited the, the uh, number of attendees. So, three or four we found was uh, the prime number. Uh, and we really tried to, to focus it on um, specific um, areas of interest. So usually I guess with focus group discussions, it was a little bit more open if we were in country um, and we could talk about a wider range of topics. But for this case, we made it just specifically for one question. So, for example, with the Prosperity Fund evaluation, it was just about the concept of uh, secondary benefits um, and or, you know, one question on um, gender and inclusion and we couldn't mix and match uh, and we couldn't discuss multiple topics at once. So it was just much more focused um, and, and smaller and we found that was really useful. Great. Uh, just in the, you know, in the spirit of time, I'm just going to ask Alita one last question, but there are a few questions in the chat box. Um, perhaps our colleagues can quickly answer. I've just saw Becky done that, had, has just done that. Um, but there's a question for Alita on the response rates. So kind of what factors can influence the response survey response rates um, and how more specifically? Sure, I think how you draw your sample using household collection instead of using one of these automated or random phone numbers helps a lot. Providing monetary incentives of one or two dollars for completion is enormous. Short surveys um, is the other one. I think those three things. Great. Well, thanks. And I think we'll look back to some of these questions um, and uh, uh, we'll answer them in the chat box as well around Cathy. I know Matt has just spent, sent a link of that, um, of a nice description of how it works. And there's a few others. But I also want to make sure that we have enough time to chat um, and gather, like we've said all along, we're in no way the experts. And there's, I'm sure, lots of people in the, this webinar who have really interesting their own alternatives. So we will be focusing on the three questions um, that we've all been talking about uh, today. Uh, there'll be a Google link that uh, Laura or Ruth will be sending through for us to fill in about how we've adapted um, male practices, you know, what we would do, what's worked, and what are we gonna take going forward? So just a bit of logistics. We have about seven minutes in these breakout rooms. They'll be very small rooms. So please make sure that you assign someone who will fill in the Google Doc, and we may have time to select one or two focus groups, uh, one or two breakout groups to report back. So please make sure that you identify someone willing to talk on your behalf. Um, so hopefully soon the breakout room link will be coming through and please click it. Rebecca, maybe um, shift the slide. I don't know if it's- Oh, sorry, yes. Slide. Yeah, I thought it might, maybe it's jammed for me. Nope. 
Sorry, um, I forgot about that entirely. Thank you. So these are the questions, questions we'll be answering. Great, so I'm gonna launch the rooms and just remember to click join. Uh, they will be a space that won't be recorded. Um, so here we go. Um, so thanks everyone for that. I realized that was a really short um, time frame for us to be having that reflection, but it, from my group, it was there was some really interesting um, lesson learning about what's kind of worked um, and you know thinking about how we can reframe questions, you know what the impact on quality is, um, how we do things better. So I'd be really interested to hear from another group. Um, I'm just going to pull one up at random and ask could group three, so the, um, or I guess there's, I'm just trying to get down, uh, group four, I'm going to go with group four about exact, you know, any lessons that you have so that the rapporteur wasn't selected, but it was Ola, Emily, or Matthew. So is one of you willing to present back? I see you, someone furiously typing, so hoping that means it's full of ideas. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if Emily's on the call, um, but it'll be, would you, would you like to report back for us just so we, we get different, um, perspective. I don't know if you're there, Emily, if not, are you there? Uh, yeah, I can give it a go. I don't have the Google documents. So I'm going to try to do it from memory. Um, <laughs> well, just focus yeah, on your, yeah, your experiences. Sorry? You could just focus on your, your experiences then, you know, the, the experiences you, answers you you mentioned sure so i think we talked a little bit about kind of new ways of working and working a lot more online than previously and i think for me that had some pros and cons so one example was doing an online workshop with some cocoa farmers from um, the ivory coast in ghana and that actually worked quite well to do it online and it brought more um, producers together from from different areas and different regions than we would have been able to reach if we'd done it in person which would have been the normal mode of working and it was also, I think, a new mode of communication. A lot of the people attending had actually kind of done an online Zoom call before and would normally just have interaction kind of face to face. So that was quite positive in terms of engaging people in a different way. And it worked quite well. Um, more, I guess the con was more when I was working, um, I worked as an independent consultant. So working with really large organizations and trying to facilitate big group meetings and um, have lots of meetings. People kind of are tired of Zoom and have a lot of fatigue about that. And just trying to make that engaging and interesting, I think was challenging at times, um, especially for people who are in meetings kind of for 12 hours a day and it's just another meeting. So yeah, I think those were a couple of key points from my experience. I don't know if you want to add anything to others in the group. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Emily. Yeah, that's really great. Um, I will now hand it over to Matt, who will just summarize some of the key lessons that have been coming out and really thanks. It was so you know, Zoom fatigue is a great one that we talked about in my group as well. How do you keep this engaging? So I hope that we manage to keep this engaging for all of you as well. Great. Um, sorry. So I'm just quickly skimming through through the document. Um, so I think in terms of how you've changed, I think everyone, like there's a lot of mention of the remote interviews and um, and I think. Um, so just, I'm just looking at group six here with, we mentioned about, um, you know, you, I think you, you're talking about a school evaluation and you need to pivot your approach. Um, and you can't, um, you, you couldn't do focus groups easily um, and you couldn't, it was difficult to get this, this, this sort of cues. Um, so I think, um, and then in terms of what worked, um, I think like we just mentioned how like it is, it's obviously convenient not to um, have to, to travel, um, but, but obviously there's sort of drawbacks um, in terms of getting access to, to, um, to, you know, to people on the ground and, and like also, you know, reaching kind of communities that are um, difficult to, who might not be online. Um, and I think I'm, I'm just also, just pulling back on the, um, the poll um, results. Um, so let me just pull that up quickly. While you do that, I see that um, Carmeliza, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, has your hand raised. So do you want to feed in, chip into some reflection no. that you have? 
Uh, yes, uh, if I may, we had very, uh, very little time <laughs> to, to give all our opinions. I see a lot of the groups had the same challenge. Uh, so one of the things that I personally had difficulties uh, was, for example, with training of teams that were going to collect data because of the quality of uh, the communication that people have, internet connections that people have, and these are very differentiated. So this was more of a challenge than the data collection in itself, which poses a, a, the challenge of a quality of training, not the quality of data collection, but then that, that means that there needs to be more time uh, in making sure that the data that comes uh, has quality. And then, of course, the issue that was already raised in reaching the, uh, the, the people who are not connected uh, is an issue. Um, and and, and a, a, a last thing um, is that um, this issue that we didn't have so much time to discuss is because usually when we are in presence, we can take more time to do things, whereas digitally we need to be conscious of time um and and we miss out on, on on some things and i think that these two points of the quality of connections and the the fact that we have to crunch in are really encroaching on on all the things we can do thanks yeah that's really nice is there anyone else who wants to just to say to say anything about their group um Because I, I, it's just hard for me to do justice, I think, summarizing it just from, from the notes. Um, I think, yeah, sorry, does anyone? Otherwise, I mean, I was just, just looking at the poll results. It's interesting how, um, you know, I think like, like half, of, half of us thought that, um, you know, our, we, our activities and our, the scope weren't actually impacted. I mean, yeah, that found that quite interesting. Um, that you know that that, that it, it it didn't actually have a huge impact on both, but um, at the same time, I think like most most people wouldn't want to keep wouldn't really want to keep all the um, the changes that have had to be made, um, and I mean that that's kind of obvious. But obviously, there's a lot of like lessons that we've learned and, and things that we will um, that we'll definitely want to keep, especially the especially the aspect of using locally based evaluators and um, you know, building building relationships and capacity of locally based evaluators. Um, yeah, but sorry, if there, anyone else wants to add to the summary, um, we are going to be sending a, a summary document. So we'll have you know all the lessons learned and um, yeah, from the case studies and the poll and, and the presentations and, and our group discussion. But thanks very much. Um, so I think I'll hand over to. To Laura, but yeah, thank thank you everyone for joining, and um, and thanks to the Alliance for for ma helping making this happen. I, I just want to add that if anyone has anything they want to put into that Google document, please do. Like Laura will talk about how we can continue this conversation because really it is about everybody's like the point that you mentioned, Car Carmeliza, about really timing. I think that's really important. You know, in how we think about how long it actually will take things and how we fit meetings into everybody's digital schedule is very different than when you're in person and how long it takes for people. You can't just jump into a discussion, maybe the same way you would. You know, it's all things that really need to be thought about, even us, right? As we do these webinars, how do we get the most out of people? So I think really useful if we can continue kind of thinking it and hope that we can continue building on everybody's experience. But we'll hand over to Laura and the Alliance um, now for some next steps, but thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Rebecca, Matthew, and all of our speakers for today. That was really, really information rich. Uh, and I just wanna outline some things that we'll be doing to kind of capture these discussions. Um, so I know that we've got a lot of questions. We've got some questions about baselines that we haven't covered. We've got a little bit about methods for joint planning. Um, so thank you for those questions that you submit in, submitted in advance. We've also made a note of all of the questions that you made just now on the webinar. So if you do have any other final questions, I would encourage you to pop them into the chat box just now. We'll capture those and see if we can find you an answer. We'll also collect all these links together. And um, thank you, Alita, for sharing some links to um, uh, methods about phone surveys that we'll share with you. And I just wanted to mention um, 
oh here are some Rebecca did you want to chat quickly to these links because there are some really uh, rich places to find more information that we might like to share yeah uh, Matt are you happy yeah sure so we so we've we've just included some links to um, to resources that, that might be helpful. They, some of them are like specifically focused on COVID-19 um, and then others are just like basic introductory uh, material on, on evaluation. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it covers like the technology side and also the um, you know the non the non-tech aspects of, of, of dealing with COVID. Um, and then I think we also added some links like there are some questions about uh, these CATI, these computer assisted um, telephone interviews, we've we put a link there. Um, but like I said earlier, we will we will send a summary um, document with with these links and and then a summary of the findings. Um, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Awesome, thank you so much. So we've got some chat box uh, reflections coming in, which is great, and we'll capture all of those. You will get a copy of the recording, and my colleague Ruth has popped in. Um, some links uh, to uh, how you can find out about future Alliance events. We've got uh, our monitoring, evaluation and learning working group that meets online and you can sign up to receive invitations for that. If you're an Alliance member, you're most welcome to use our Alliance community, which is a digital forum to continue these conversations. Um, so you might like to give people tips. Recently, we've had someone looking um, for help uh, advertising and evaluation, but also looking for Malawi based uh, staff to do data collection. So that's a source for you to find advice and information and to share your learning as well. Work. So if you'd like any more information, you can get in contact with us via the email that we sent um, the joining instructions from. We'll, we'll definitely be in contact with the resources very soon. Um, and I think because we're wrapping up five minutes early, Rebecca, do we want to take one final question? Yeah, I think as long as everyone's happy, sorry, I always like to try and make sure people have time between to get tea between meetings um, and run to the toilet because I think that's often an issue I have in back to back meetings. Um, but there was a question, I think, because we do have Alita on sampling strategies on telephone interviews. I wondered, Alita, um, you've had quite a few questions about that and kind of how you make sure that I wondered if you felt comfortable talking about that a bit more. Um, specific questions, I mean, we mostly use that household collective sampling frame. I'd love to hear about kind of the experience in Mozambique with that snowball sampling that she talks about. The IPA document that I sent the link out of also has a really good primer on sort of the trade-offs of different sampling strategies in both cost and response rate. So that's a good place to start. Great. Do Carmelisa, do you want to speak a little bit about the snowballing sampling that you've done in Mozambique? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's ex exactly because we have a bit more of a challenge. I, I've, I've, we've heard about different methods that then you can access so random numbers, but we wanted to control the sample a little bit more because we wanted to reach people with, uh, which had less access or used less uh, social media. So we wanted to control the, the, the sample that way. And we wanted to make sure that we found people all over the country. Um, and if we did this random number search, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to control for that. Um, and what we did was we began with uh, 10 numbers and then we snowballed from, uh, each interviewer had 10 numbers they started with, and then we snowballed from that. From that which was that the person had to, that was called, had to give a reference of another number uh, and then inform that person that they had given that number. And, and uh, we have 11 provinces. And so in each of the province, we sampled 75 people out of these 10, which meant um, seven, more or less seven, or eight references per person. And it worked really well. The rate of the response was really good. I think we just had um, uh, about 5% uh, dropout. And that's why I was sort of kind, kind of um, wondering why, why, why such a low um, uh, sample, uh, sample rate uh, that was mentioned, 80%, because we have, 
we felt that we had more success, but maybe it was because the method was different. I don't know. Yeah, was that a new sample you're recruiting, not a panel you're following up on? Uh, that was a new one. So now we are doing a panel of, of uh, following a panel, and we'll. I will let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's a great first. That's a really high success rate, though. That's great that that sampling strategy worked. But yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I hope it stays high. I, I hope it stays high. Our our success rate in panels um, offline is eighty five. So yeah, uh, yeah, then I agree. But uh, we'll see. <laughs> Because people change numbers, they disconnect, mm -hmm. they, uh, the, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> and and actually, <laughs> this one that we're doing, the panel, is it's actually an even more, sense, it's LGBT community, so <laughs> uh, we're expecting a high drop there. Yeah. So, Great. I just like, wondered if we had one last time for one last question, um, and I think Clarissa will have something really useful on this, but I realize you have about a minute, Clarissa. Um, someone had asked a question in advance about joint planning, and I know Clarissa had 65 interviews that they had to conduct and had quite a series of technologies to help with planning and how you plan those meetings that way. Uh, yeah, no, thanks. Um, so yeah, with one minute, I'll try and go really fast. Um, but yeah, basically to get very organized, we, we divided uh, each piece of analysis. Um, between the, the, deep, the team members. Uh, we had a spreadsheet going, who was facilitating what language the interview was going to be in um, and who, who was gonna be the note taker. We had a really organized filing system. Um, and then we had two people in charge of coding all the interviews. So there was also um, a, another column where we organized who's facilitating language and who needs to be present in the interview to probe additional questions of interest for the different thematic studies that we had to cover. Um, and yeah, and then with the workshops um, and all the agendas, we had sent uh, the team, as I mentioned before, a bit of homework, but hopefully fun homework to just kind of plop down key, um, you know, key areas of interest and topics to cover just to make sure we were, we had a very focused but useful and participatory agenda. Um, but yeah, happy to, to go into more detail with whoever asked that question um, after. Great. Well, thanks everyone. I think that, that we're bang on time now. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for your participation. And as I will hand it back to Laura, but I think that um, we'll be in touch with some kind of materials from this. And as everyone has said, really happy to continue any of these discussions going forward.